um, for our uh, series on New Directions and Actions of Urban Health Research. And today we're very fortunate to have uh, Jose Pagan joining us. Uh, he, he came up from uh, New York City, or down, I don't know. New York City, is. yeah. <laughs> up or down. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Jose is director of the Center for Health Innovation at the New York Academy of Medicine. And before joining the New York Academy of Medicine, um, he uh, was involved in um, a very large project in the Center for, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to, um, to work on a range of issues related to health care, health services research. And he was professor and chair of the Department of Health Management and Policy at the School of Public Health at the University of North, North Texas Health Science Center. And uh, I actually met Jose when he was a Robert Wood Johnson Health Society scholar here at Penn. And I was at Michigan as, uh, as co-director, I think, of the program there. And so we met at one of the uh, meetings and we remained in contact throughout. And, uh, and we thought it would be wonderful to have him come to, uh, to talk to us about some of the work that he has been doing uh, in New York and in other places that have to do with this intersection between healthcare and public health. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. And uh, thank, thank you for the invitation. It is, it is an honor to be here. You know, I, uh, I actually spent two years living in Philly, so it's nice to, to come back and walk around and see how much, how much things change, even in, in a very, very short period of time. Uh, and then uh, what, I, what I wanted to do today was tell you a little bit about the work we, some of the work that I've done around making the business case for different sorts of programs. And, and uh, I'm, a health, I'm a health economist and I do a lot of work on cost effectiveness, areas like that. But a lot, of, a lot of what I'm interested in is work connected to how do you help an organization uh, be more effective at making the case for the program they have. And I faced that actually when I was a professor at, at the School of Public Health at UNT Health Science Center in Fort Worth, where we would send our NPH and MHA students out into the community and they would work with organizations and come back and ask me all these questions. How can I help my organization to keep a program going? And I was always thinking, okay, how can I empower the students to, to do it? Not only because it's a good thing, but also because it, it, I just cannot do a lot of this. And so anyway, that's that's sort of like the background reason of why I got I got into this. So I started thinking a lot about like, how do you do that? And the answer at the end, you're gonna see that it's it's you just have to listen a lot, pay a lot of attention to what people are looking for, and then and then go from there. So that's basically what you're gonna get out of this. So. Um, given that your focus is in urban health, it's also nice to be here because. The New York Academy of Medicine, uh, it's, uh, it's actually that building on the corner of uh, Fifth Avenue and, and 103rd. Uh, people don't know what it is, it's just a building there. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's basically a nonprofit uh, organization that basically works around urban health issues. And these issues range from, uh, from policy work, for example, giving advice to the state or the city on policy issues to doing research, for example, through several research centers that, that all fit into this thing called the Institute for Urban Health. And, uh, and there are also a network of about 2,000 fellows, just like the National Academy of Sciences or the, the National Academy of Medicine, uh, where they basically get together, try to address problems and, 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 and in issues connected to public health and healthcare, not only in the city of New York, but across the state and, and, and the nation. And then the library, which is, if you like, History of medicine, it's a, it's a great place to go. Uh, so, so what I do there is we have a center called Center for Health Innovation. Um, and basically, uh, we do work around this intersection between, between sort of like um, healthcare delivery system and multiple determinants of health. So a lot of the work that I'm gonna talk about has to do with how do you pay for things that healthcare delivery systems don't do. Good think about or want to pay for. And I'll, I'll make that argument in a second. Um, so let me, and by the way, I do that work with a uh, with, uh, health economist, biomedical engineer. We also get interns from all over the city that work with us. And then we have a health, health policy, policy division, which is extremely useful because they, they're, they're really engaged in the community and they know a lot of the issues and you're able to bounce ideas back and forth with, with policy analysts. Um, so I, 
I was very interested and in, in involved in this whole issue of like uh, the Affordable Care Act. Actually, a lot of the work that I've done before is in this report called Americas on Insured Crisis, which it's, it's work about how communities are impacted by your insurance uh, and how, how do you argue that providing coverage to people is a good deal. So people will, people will typically say, OK, you provide coverage, people have better access to care. It's much harder to show that if you provide coverage, they, they become healthy. The work that I was doing back then had to do with how do I show that to ensure people that providing coverage to others is actually good for them? Okay, so that's that's sort of like making the case for covering people, not because it's good for people that need the coverage, but because it's good for the community. So all of that work actually came out in, the, in a IOM report in 2009 called America's Uninsured Crisis. And so I've been paying attention to, to what has been going around and Basically, if you go back and think about how the affordable care came about, a lot, of, a lot of the discussion was mostly about, it was about making healthcare affordable, but it was also about calling people. And, and uh, so you heard people talk about the triple A, right? Improving population health, the patient experience, decreasing uh, per capita cost. At the end of the day, many, most of the discussion really shifted towards basically cost reduction. So, you can talk about quality, you can talk about a lot of different things, but at the end of the day, if you're involved in any healthcare program, you'll see that cost is like the main, the main driver of the conversation. And, and uh, uh, here's, a, here's a ridiculous oversimplification of the issue, but this is the way that I tend to think about this. So think about, think about the factors that impact health, population health, and among them you have healthcare, Healthcare being, depending on who you ask, 10 to 20 percent of what what explains basically variations in health. But then you have all these other factors: social services, social environmental determinants, and so on. Um, and then when you think about healthcare expenditures, think about a service that has a given price times you know the amount of that service being delivered. So in a way, it became it becomes difficult to go to someone and say. You know, you, you get paid $100 to provide a service. Now I'm going to reduce that price by 20% to, to, to reduce cost. So in a way, you could reduce healthcare expenditures by saying, I'm going to cut the prices by a given amount, which means that a lot of organizations are going to go after you and, and attack you in many different ways, uh, decisions being one of them, for example. But, you could, but, it, but really, what happened was, it became more about like, okay, I'm not going to touch prices. Can I then reduce costs in a way that people just, if you provide a very high service, high price service, all I have to do is make sure that people just don't use your service. <laughs> that's basically what's going on. And that's, that, that's the way that I look at it. Uh, so that means that there are a lot of opportunities because as long as, if, if I'm managing a population from a health plan, if I'm an accountable care organization and I, I'm getting paid according to the difference between expected expenditures and what I can save, anything that can save me money, if I put people in a park to do yoga and that saves me money, I'm going to pay attention to it. Okay, so that's, that's basically the main idea of this. So that means that any, any even, even things that don't have a price in the healthcare delivery system actually may have value. The problem is that that many of these organizations that do the management side of it, they have a hard time seeing, seeing value in many of the things we do in public health. Uh, part of the reason, one observation, for example, that I've seen is that if your board in an ACO is made up of, of, uh, of clinicians, they, don't, they can't think beyond clinical care because they, that's just, you know, they may think it's a good idea to do other things, but really it's hard for them to think beyond that. So there's structural issues there that are, that are very difficult to deal with. But in any case, if you can show in, in a convincing way that you can save money to someone, at least people will listen to it. And, and then the issue here is how do, how do you perfect that language? Um, and uh, and so, so what's happening basically is you're going to have these increases uh, in uh, healthcare spending is going to continue to, to grow. So people are basically saying, okay, how can I slow that down and figure out a way to organize the system in a way that you slow that down? Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of health, com uh, 
couple of examples on this, on, on sort of like health conditions that are costly, and then um, how uh, how people are thinking about it in terms of payers and so on. The first one is uh, a lot of the work that we have done has been around diabetes. So you're talking about 29 million people in the U.S. with diabetes, 86 million that have what they call we call prediabetes, and people are interested on it because it is. It is costly, and it has all these consequences. So as a, as a preview so what, to what I'm going to talk to you about how to make the case, then, then that tells you that if you're going to make a case connected to a diabetes prevention or management program, then the, the issues that you would address are connected to cost or some of the consequences. And it's hard to tell whether somebody's going to be uh, convinced by a cost argument or sort of like a consequences argument uh, to it. So in a way, what I tend to tell folks is, you know, you have to listen to what a person wants or needs and then figure out how you make that case once you gather that information. Um, it, is a, it is a big deal if you're looking for projects not only in the US, but if you look abroad, uh, we, we get a lot, of, uh, a lot of work now internationally that I never thought we would connected to, for example, diabetes and, and diabetes prevention. I mean, look at the numbers here. This is from the International <coughs> Diabetes Federation um, for um, places like India and, and China. So if you think this is an issue in the US, you know, um, then India and China are, uh, that there are a lot of challenges there. So there, in many, in many countries, you know, you have health healthcare systems that were set up basically for uh, infectious disease more than like chronic disease management. So they're, they're sort of like, not that they're looking for answers in the US, but they're looking for answers anywhere, okay? Um, and uh, so if you look at the numbers, for example, um, this whole issue of global health and chronic disease prevention and management, it's, it's something that I see it's, it's gonna keep, keep growing, so. Um, if, uh, if, uh, if, you, if you do research in the U.S., because a lot of the money stays in the U.S. and comes from sources in the U.S., you tend to think that the world ends, you know, around our borders. And I actually used to think like that when I when I really got into healthcare, because like you couldn't get funding to do anything outside, and that's actually changing now because of these challenges. Okay. So the other example with di diabetes being a good one, but if you look at any sort of chronic health conditions, you know. Think about how payers uh, look at folks with multiple chronic conditions. And these this are just some numbers so that you, you think about how a payer like Medicare, for example, <coughs> looks at uh, uh, chronic conditions and savings that they could attain. So for example, these are, these are uh, uh, this, this comes from a report that CMS put out on chronic conditions among Medicare beneficiaries, and you can see that you basically see this, you know, if you have zero to one, you cost Medicare about $2,000 per year, but if you keep, you know, as the number of chronic health conditions go up, your costs keep, keep going up. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, they're very conscious about numbers like that, and they put out programs and activities to, to address that. Um, I, I was giving a, a talk last year, last, uh, last August, and the, the CEO from Cigna, who's a panel organized by Cigna about population health in Houston, and he showed this number. So I only bring it in so that you see how the health plan, for example, looks at this. And uh, so uh, he presented some data uh, from their, you know, um, beneficiaries, and, and and it's interesting how they slice the data. So, for example, if you look at BMI or cholesterol, for example. Uh, definition of obesity there. You can see that that uh, uh, the difference in, in total healthcare cost for the health plan between somebody with a BMI above 30 or below 30 is it's pretty substantial, $2,400 per year. And uh, they use information like that to basically think about screening programs and so on that they, they could implement. Um, but the, the point is that if you look at a number like that, then you know that uh, it could be an employer that that gets a sense of how much their, their employees cost and say, okay, 
if I can figure out a program that can reduce that number by X amount, then then I'll buy it. But the other one could be the health plan. You know, if if if, if somebody comes up and tells me, here's a strategy that I could follow to, to reduce costs, then I'll I'll do it. Um, so and, and you can see similar data here with the number of chronic conditions where you see that yearly total cost per, per customer goes up uh, from $3,000 if you have zero to uh, $12,000 $12, if you have two or more current conditions. Okay? So Medicare, uh, private payer, uh, you could see the same with Medicaid in many ways because states face pressure to provide coverage to, to, to uh, uh, low-income individuals, so those pressures are there. So here's, here's, a, so here's what's happening then. You have, uh, you're moving from a system that is fee-for-service and counter-based to one where you're looking at an episode of care or you're, and you're looking at a global payment. Um, this is actually a slide probably from 2010 when people, 2011 when people started talking about this. I would put that X maybe in the middle uh, there. But I think we're still in this transition period where um, there, People are coming up with a lot of new programs, and they're trying to, sh they're trying very hard to show that <coughs> something works, and they're trying to, to try very hard to get an accountable care organization, a hospital, an employer to actually adopt that. And it also means there's a lot of noise out there. So uh, if you're a hospital, you get bombarded by people trying to sell you things connected to how to improve transitions of care or how to manage certain populations. So. Uh, this this whole issue of making the case become even more important because because they because you basically have a lot of entrepreneurs that are seeing that they can make money doing things so there's a lot of noise from the point of view of the purchaser uh, coming in because you don't know what what works what doesn't and, and uh, that that makes it that makes it difficult so I'll give you some examples on these new structures okay? three examples that are totally totally different one is you you've seen when people talk about patient-centered medical forms or, or patient-centered care, uh, that's one structure that is in place now that basically you're talking about a, a clinic that is set up in a way that people are, are very proactive when it comes to managing people. So they identify patients, they figure out programs to, to keep them healthy, they may have patient navigators, <coughs> doctors, community health workers, tons of support, access on weekends, uh, they call at night, all sorts of things. But the point is to, to, to coordinate care for that population. And typically, uh, because it's hard to do this, you know, it's, it's hard to figure out how to pay, you get a payment. So if you're set up like that, the health plan may give you a payment, a monthly payment per beneficiary or something like that to, to make it happen because you cannot allocate it to a specific service. It's almost like the, the whole coordination piece. Um, in many states, you know, you have that plus you have people developing even, even more interesting models connected to like advanced primary care or combining uh, um, behavioral health with physical health or even even doing more interesting work which is like connecting social services with with uh, the healthcare delivery system. Um, Medicare for example <coughs> are called a kind of a health community that was actually designed by one of the people that designed it was a health and society scholar that was here at Penn Valley. And it's basically to, so you basically apply and if you, if you do referrals for social services, they, they basically will help you fund the referral system, employment, housing, and so on. Which goes beyond what they typically do, right? Because what they typically do is pay for healthcare services. Okay, so that's, that's an example of that. Um, and this, um, you know, Patient-centered care has grown up a whole lot, but um, there, there are a few reports out there that will tell you how much money you save by uh, setting up a patient-centered medical home. Uh, they're hard to compare because everybody tracks a different outcome, so some will focus on emergency department visits, so they don't order some cost. Some may, may focus on some clinical outcomes, so the few reports that you'll see out there will be either, well, it'll be about one specific uh, demonstration project, right, from a patient center medical home, but it would be basically some sort of, uh, some sort of aggregate report that includes every, every single uh, 
uh, patient-centered care. Patient-centered medical home model out there, like, like this report, for example, that comes from the patient-centered primary care collaborative. Um, so there's some evidence that they work and they save money and, 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 and reduce city visits and, and, and hospitalization. So that's example number one. So, you know, how to organize a clinic. Another one is how, for example, organizations are coming together to sort of like manage a population. And one of the models that you have seen is something called accountable care organizations. So, for example, it could be you could have a, a, a primary care provider, specialty practice, home health. Many of them are organized around hospitals. But basically, you have a you live in a given city or town. A bunch of people get together and they sign a contract to basically manage a population. They make make money by basically saving money to to the payers. So you they're they're more popular in Medicare, but you also are seeing them in many states in Medicaid and and by private payers. And, and this has been growing like crazy. So uh, the third one, though, that I always find this interesting because it, it's happening. There are many reform efforts happening at the state level, but you don't hear about them because people tend to focus at the, at the federal level. And one of the most interesting ones right now, it's, it's what they call a Medicaid 1115 waiver, the delivery system reform incentive pool. So some states have been able to get a Medicaid waiver that if they promise to deliver certain savings in the state, they get, they get tons of money from the feds, okay? And the amount of money that they get is, is actually pretty substantial. Uh, and basically what they do is they have to develop projects to improve health or reduce costs. In, in, in New York, for example, the, the Medicaid 1115 waiver, the goal is to reduce in five years, we use the number of hospital admissions by 25%. So if you're in the hospital business, you know what's coming uh, uh, in terms of like what the state is thinking about with these Medicaid funds that come in. And when I say that the money is substantial, if you look at this map of the US, we're talking about $6.4 billion in New York. That's a lot of money. And I. I lived for a long time in the great state of Texas, so $11 billion, $11 billion in Texas. So for example, if you talk to, try to think how much the health department, for example, uh, in San Antonio, I, I'll show you some data from San Antonio, a project that I'm working on, where 35% of their budget now comes from the Medicaid, Medicaid waiver projects, connected to anything from uh, dental uh, seals for kids, you know, for uh, uh, seals to uh, diabetes prevention, to TB, to anything that you can think of, funded through this. Um, and that's happening all over the state. So that the three key ones are California that started it, I mean, in terms of large Texas and New York. Or maybe those are the three states that I think about because they're the larger states. If you live in Texas, you tend to think about only large states. That's just something that I've experienced. Coming from a small place, I grew up in Puerto Rico. Nobody cares, you know, it's too small. <laughs> but uh, large states, people do care. Um, so so here's, here's, here's an example of the opportunities out there. So before, let's say, you know, somebody was, somebody ended up in the ED, they were admitted, and then they, they get discharged, and, and they get outpatient care. You have basically um, <coughs> programs that allow you to manage that population. So as long as you're doing something, for example, that <coughs> can reduce cost to the system or help you manage a population, then you're in business. So for example, um, um, Medicare, Medicare started a program called the Hospital Readmissions Reduction Program. Uh, and uh, they started about two, about two years ago where you basically, hospitals get penalized if they have high hospital readmissions. What that meant was that um, if there's anything you can do to keep somebody out of the hospital for the targeted health conditions that, that they're working on from day one to day 30, it doesn't matter, day 31 doesn't matter, day one to day 30. If you can do something 
to keep people at home. Maybe lock, lock them in their house, whatever it is. But if you can do something, you'll, you're in business, okay? So hospital, for example, will tend to be interested in, in any sort of intervention that you can come up with that can keep somebody healthy at home. So um, I have a project, for example, a, a district project, Medicaid waiver project in Texas where we're, we put these monitors at people's homes and then we monitor them from, from uh, when they get discharged, they go home and this company monitors them and that has an effect of reducing the admission. So this is their business line, you know, they, they just, they contract with different uh, providers and systems to basically take people out of the hospital, put them at home, monitor them, and save money. And it works because you're, you're basically keeping track of someone 24 seven, which is different from just sending a nurse once a week or twice a week. Something goes wrong over the weekend, you catch it. And basically that's the way those systems work. So that's, that's uh, remote monitoring. Um, so again, um, so, so any of these folks that are here trying to make some money on this, they have to figure out a way, okay, how do I show that what I, what I do matters, you know, so that somebody pays for it. Um, so um, there, there are tons of different business models on this. I mean, it's, it's the, uh, I, I'm very interested in the business side of this and how people come up with new ideas to, to solve problems. So a good example of companies that I've actually uh, uh, dealt with or worked with is a company that called like Loopback Analytics in Dallas that all they do is get a lot of data and help you, for example, manage the number of uh, uh, patients that are in your hospital, which programs they go to, and then how many of them come back. So basically they provide data to, to uh, people that are running programs, but also hospitals to see how that to see which programs are working. And, uh, and uh, something that I find very interesting is how also how people morph from providing one line of service to something else. So uh, I can tell you examples connected to baseball, but um, um, with Nolan, you know who Nolan Ryan is? Nolan Ryan, it's a picture, it's a picture, right? It's a picture. He also sells, uh, uh, Medicaid advan Medicare Advantage plans in Texas now, <laughs> and, and also stakes. <laughs> stakes. <laughs> so stakes. I actually, I actually walked once into a, a, a Medicare Advantage plan, thinking about ways to work with them. And if you come from a place where people play baseball, like I did, my only interest in working with this organization was because Nolan Ryan was their spokesperson. <laughs> and I was like, oh, maybe I'll get a share of a book, you know. Yeah. But anyway, so here's, a, here's an example of a company like that that reinvented themselves. You know, they went from, you cannot see it there, but their name was called, called Home Healthcare Partners. The company that I told you about that was doing remote patient monitoring. They, they, they started doing it as a way of uh, making more money on the home healthcare side of the business. Because if people stay with you for an episode of 60 days, if they're on Medicare, then you make you make some money, but if they leave in a few weeks and they end up at the hospital, the payment is much smaller and it's not like prorated. So they figured out, you know, if I can keep people out of the hospital, if I can keep them as my clients, then I make, I make, I make money. Their name has morphed to, uh, actually they're called Care Cycle Management, or they have, they're also called Care Cycle Solutions. So they went from home health partners to Care Cycle Solutions. And just like that, you can see many examples across the country. Um, so I'll, I'm, I'm gonna skip this one because it's, this is a project that I, that I work on, but I, well, I'll tell you what it is quickly, but it's, uh, it's uh, um, when, when Medicare, when CMS started, started experimenting with uh, different ways of reducing cost, they, they created this project, this program called the CMS Innovations Award, and, and I had, I was the principal investigator of a project like that. We work with a company called Brookdale Senior Living uh, to basically <clears throat> keep people safe at nursing homes. So, and also at assisted living facilities and uh, independent living facilities in the, across the country. 
Uh, Brooktail is the largest operator of senior living facilities in the US. They're all over the country, 30 something states. Uh, and they, uh, um, they depend on people coming in from hospitals. You know, they get discharged and they have to build relationships with hospitals to be able to get residents. Uh, so when the hospital readmissions penalties started, then they, they paid a lot of attention to how do we, what kind of programs can we implement to keep people safe? So one of them was <coughs> a program called Interact. I don't know if you've heard of Interact before, but it's basically a protocol where, suppose that we are all employees of a nursing home uh, from, from the gardener to the cook, and not just the nurses. And all of you pay attention to the residents. So for example, if you see, if you see Jose walking and he fell, or he, uh, he didn't eat that day, or you see him losing weight, then you report that information. So anyway, we implemented a system like that to basically keep track of residents and keep them, keep them basically reduce the likelihood that they ended up at the hospital. And, uh, and, uh, but again, the purpose of that was to basically work, keep that relationship with hospitals going, reduce cost to the system. But from the point of view of a company, it was more about how can I how can I show that my nursing home has a lower hospital readmission rate than somebody else's nursing home in the same local market? So that's the main, that's basically what you're trying to do. Um, ironically, one thing I learned after that was that, that uh, uh, if you think about it, when, when you take a, a family member, a loved one to a nursing home or their family member is going to an assisted living facility then, you pay attention to our safety. So really, anything that keeps people safe, it's a, it's a very big deal because it means that you're able to keep keep rooms rented, basically, if you think about it. So it's not just reducing hospital admissions and reducing costs, but it's also you know, your line of business is keeping people safe. Because that's, that's what you want to know when you, leave, when, you, when you leave your father or mother there. You want to make sure that they're safe. Um, Anyway, um, so organizations like this basically <coughs> need data and need to make the case that what they're doing has an effect. They do it both on the safety side and on the cost side. And they do it to both the hospitals in their local markets as well as CMS, Medicare, because um, they, they can have a huge impact. So um, this is an example then on this transformation, it's a quote from, um, uh, from Ken Davis, who's the CEO of the Mount Sinai Health System, um, that basically tells you what's going on. Um, so the hospital is not just interested now or making money on the number of beds that are full, that, that are, that are uh, full, it's more about managing, managing the population. Uh, and uh, so if you've been paying attention to what, uh, at least from my perspective, what I've seen in the healthcare space is that, what that means is that if you live in a given community, then the more you know about the people that live in, in, you know, in this box where you live, the better off you are because the better you're able to manage the cost side. So um, systems like this, you know, they, what they will do is then, then buy buy other hospitals strategically, <coughs> clinics, invest in health plans, have an ACO, sign contracts with employers. It's a lot more complex than, than, than uh, you may think, actually, or that I thought, at least. The, the, the more I learn about it, the more, uh, the more um, interesting it gets in terms of like how they manage populations. But you see that also with health plans now, you know, where uh, what was it, United Health. United Health lost money. I don't know if you saw this in the news uh, recently last year. They lost money on the uh, on the exchanges, a lot of money actually, on the exchanges. But they ended up making money for the year because they own a, a comp I don't know if it's Optum, Optum, but they own not they own a, basically a managed care a population health management organization, and that's where they ended up making money. So you see this convergence towards towards like the population health management side of things. Um, so, so 
So now that, that I gave you all that background information, and again, I did it on the healthcare side, but this you could you could apply this in any any situation where you're trying to convince someone that they should fund your project. Okay, so that's um, it could be a city, it could be it could be anyone. Um, it's easier for me to think about it in terms of the healthcare delivery side because of the amount of money that is coming in, and that tends to be. Somebody told me the other day, if you want to follow a story, follow the money, and that tells you, gets you to the story. So basically, that's what you that's what you see. Plus, you can help if you're an economist, right? So, so this is a big question. You know, so this is a question you get asked: Is, is your program worth it, right? Um, <coughs> you run a program, you know, you finish your MPH, your MHA, you're out there, and then people people ask you basically. Questions like, are we getting a positive ROI, return on investment? Is your program cost effective? Is it a better investment than other programs? These are questions that you face whenever you have a program and, and there are other activities where you work that compete with that activity, you do, okay? Uh, um, in, in a, if you work at a local health department, they may have 10 activities, and in a given year, they may have money for nine, so one is gonna get caught, how do they decide which one to cut? That's that's basically the, the key issue. Um, so these are just a lot of what I'm going to tell you are observations that I've made from having worked with, with different people. So one of the things that I notice is that uh, people don't think like this because they see everything through their professional lens. So. Um, and by that I mean that um, if, if you, for example, are into, a, a, you study nutrition, for example, then you, you really think that your program is excellent because it's connected to nutrition and it's making people healthy, but you're not thinking about like how much money you're saving in the healthcare system. And even if you try really hard to do that, it still won't come out the same way. It will be like me trying to pitch like no I'm right. No matter how much I practice, I'll never be not right. Okay? Uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. An example that I like to use on this, I mean, I, so my, my younger brother is an architect. And it's a lot of fun to walk around the city with him. Because you're walking down the city and he's looking at buildings. I'm looking at the same building he's looking at. And I'm looking at like, I wonder how much that costs per square feet to build that thing, or how much they charge in rent, how much is occupied, crime rates, I look at the public health side of things. He's looking at like how the sun is heating the building. Uh, I mean, things that I would never think of. And, and it's all connected to your background. So the lesson, one of the lessons there is that you need to find people then that can use that language that you need if you need to, to, to pitch an idea to someone or find partner with people that that can help you make the case for your program. Uh, the other challenge, of course, is that there's never enough money to do things like that, right? Uh, and many of the things that I'll show you are things that I've thought about because I've, I've, told, I've, talk, I've talked to folks about this in terms of like, for example, some of the modeling that I'll show you in a second, uh, connected to basically simulation models and forecasting and so on, or health and cost outcomes, and the, the answer that I get from people is like, hmm, that's an excellent tool for something that I don't want to evaluate, mm -hmm. basically. That I don't want to spend money evaluating, because if I don't want to spend money evaluating, therefore, I'm just going to simulate it, and, and that will cost me, you know, one hundredth of what it would cost to implement it or to test it. Um, so, um, basically, think, think, about, think about a program that People join, so these are the number of years from 50 to 70, or 20 years out, and costs on the other side. Um, for many of the activities we do in public health, what happens is that you implement the program, say, from, for three years, and you see, you, see the co you, see you have a cost structure. The cost may even go down. The, benef the benefits may go up, but you really don't see the costs are so much higher, you know, like if you do something connected to prevention that is so much higher in the short term that there's no way that the program works. So a lot of the work that I'll show you has to do with how do you, how do you see this, 
darker part that I put there, which is the part that you don't see. How do you see that using uh, modeling or forecasting techniques? So I'll show you some examples in a second. Um, that's basically all what you're trying to show. And depending on the organization that you're pitching this to, this may matter or may not. If it's somebody that is looking at a very short time frame, then you have to think different than this. But in many cases, you know, if you're talking about like a, a Medicaid plan in a state, or a, uh, for example, a hospital that has a, a, a financial assistance program, but people don't get out of that system of that much, then they, they look at problems more in a more, more long term. So some of this sometimes sometimes helps. Um, so a lot of this is then it's a combination of what I call the science and art. That's what it is. And at the end of the day, it's all about persuading someone to believe something. So. What I'm trying to say is that there's no right or wrong answer here. It's basically, it's, it all boils down to your ability to persuade someone that what you're doing it's, will benefit whomever you're pitching that to. Um, so, so how do we convince someone that a given program is a good investment? Um, sometimes, sometimes you don't need to do this, of course. And, and so if you don't need to do this, then you don't need to build a case. So for example, if you know that somebody's gonna fund you anyway, or they like your program, then who cares about all of this? But in most cases, you know, you, you, you do have to put some, some effort into it. And, and that effort involves basically trying to understand the context in which that program is being implemented and, and how you're gonna use that information to, to, to make the case. So I'll show you a couple of examples here that I've, that I've worked on that you may find interesting. So one is one is on disease progression. So I'll show you how I have done it. And the, the, I, I try to, to sh I, I'm gonna give you examples that are all over the place, just so that you see that, that this has many applications, thinking like this. So one is disease progression. So, you know, a few years back, I, uh, about three years ago, I became interested in this model called the Archimedes model. Uh, part of the reason was, it's a model basically it's, it's a model of a simulation model of not only physiology, uh, you know, organs of the body and how they're all connected, uh, but also the healthcare delivery system and outcomes. And part of the reason why this big simulation model looks at the healthcare delivery system and outcomes is because the, the person that built it, David Eddy, they would use it at Kaiser Permanente, they built it basically to, to uh, uh, to make decisions, clinical decisions about, for example, which type of treatments to adopt and so on. So he has the, the guy has an MD and a PhD in math, so it's, he has a sort of like the biology side of it and then the healthcare delivery side of it. Many models only have the biology side of it or the healthcare delivery side of it, but not a combination of both. So just to give you an example of how, how <coughs> the model looks like, and there are no equations here, but you can see that, for example, for diabetes, what these models do is they connect they connect many variables. So for example, if you give somebody, uh, I don't know, a medication or intervention that changes BMI, you can see how that would work. <coughs> or if you reduce systolic, uh, systolic blood pressure, you can see how that would work. And then, and then there are models, and the models are huge, you know, uh, for, for different consequences, from, for example, managing glucose. Or, um, and uh, so, and people have, you know, there are tons of studies validating the models showing how the models work over time. So that, that's important because if you're trying to make the case of something using models and you want to show, okay, this model has been validated, people believe that it predicts okay. And there, for a model like that, there are many validation exercises done that show basically that the model predicts well. So I won't go into the details of that, but um, that's an example uh, on, you know, fasting plasma glucose. And, using data from a, thing, from a, a, a clinical trial, a trial basically. Um, so the Robert Johnson Foundation, which are close to here, actually, they're uh, one of my benefactors. Um, they, they actually built, so the model is expensive to use if you work with a company that built it, but they, the foundation gave money to build an interface to the model. That's how I got into this. Uh, basically, the interface allows you to use the model in a very easy way. 
And that's, that's basically uh, how I, I started into it. So to give you an example of applications of this is, here's an example, more of a policy analysis on patient-centered care. It's more of a paper that we worked on where um, I told you earlier that patient-centered medical homes are complex and they, they, they're complex, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, in terms of the outcomes that they track. They're all over the place. But for some programs, they do track a few outcomes that are consistent because they have to meet certain quality indicators. One of them is uh, um, having your di diabetes under control or not having it under control, so having an A1C above 90. So basically what I, what we did with the model, what you can do with models like this is say, if I'm a patient-centered medical home and I manage somebody that has an A1C that is not under control, would that be, for example, cost-effective? What is the effect of that if I put someone on their patient-centered medical home versus another usual care? Let's call it usual care because that's, what, that's how the model works. Um, this was a very simple, sort of the way I approach is a very crude, simple policy analysis, but um, it's hard to get data on, on uh, the cost of a program like that. Uh, so I used $20, which is what Medicare would pay in some demonstration projects on patient centered care. That's the price per beneficiary per month. Uh, it's, it's based on a bunch of studies about patient centered care, so patient centered medical homes, so it's hard to tell for how many people that don't have diabetes under control, how many of them become under control. So that's how I got the, uh, I call it their adherence rate, but it's 49%. And basically what you get from it is you get, you can get things like uh, uh, anything. From, if you're an economist, you like to talk about uh, cost-effectiveness ratios, you know, $7,800. That basically, if you want to buy a year of life, that's how much it's going to cost you. What if you adjust it? $7,900, so that's, that's very cheap, uh, meaning it's a good deal. Uh, it's even a better deal for people between 50 and 64. And then you can get answers to questions like, so there's some people that are interested in with amputations or MIs and so on, and that information is useful too. Okay, so, so they're gonna be, so when you're making a case for anything, there are gonna be two types of people. The ones that care about cost, right? Well, there are more than two types of people. But some will care about cost, some will care about something else. And some of the reasons they'll care about things are totally unrelated to, to things that would make common sense to you. But so to give you an example, let's say you're pitching this to someone you're saying, no, we should do patient-centered care for, for these folks at a clinic. And it so happened that my great-grandpa died of a, of a heart attack. Then, don't ask me why, but for whatever reason, the fact that I provided that number will have a better and bigger effect than anything else I, any other information I provide. And that's just something that I've seen. That uh, it's, 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 you know, it's just the way it is. So a lot of it is, you have to, you have to, you have to engage in conversations with, with whomever your benefactor is or whomever wants to implement your program to basically get a sense of you know, what, what is the hook you're gonna use. This is the art part when you, when you try to defend your program. So if you work in that health department, there are 10 projects. Uh, yours is about exercise and, and biking and you know your supervisor likes to bike, you better think about like how to, how to pitch that angle and the likelihood that it will be unfair to others, but I'm not getting into ethical issues here. I'm just telling you that, <laughs> that that's gonna that's that's gonna work, or may work. Um, okay, so I'll 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 move quickly through this. So after that, because I, we were working with a private company, it was very hard to like open the hood and see what was going on. I didn't have a lot of flexibility, so I started working with an engineer, a biomedical engineer, to build our own model. And we even had a design person doing infographics, so he helped us a, a bit with the design. So we built this model that we call the cardiovascular health simulation model. It's based on the American Heart Association's uh, uh, model or approach of looking at ideal cardiovascular health. The idea that uh, don't look at the bad things that happen to somebody that has cardiovascular disease, look at the good side of it. So instead of talking about heart attacks, <coughs> talk about cardiovascular health. Um, basically, the way, this is an early version of 
of what we were, were doing on this, but um, it's hard to see here. But basically, the model, all the model does is says, says you could exercise, you could eat better, that has an impact on obesity. Uh, um, you could also smoke or not smoke. And then all these things have consequences when it comes to uh, hypertension, diabetes, and, uh, and then that has consequences after that connected to stroke, heart attack, or you could die. So they're basically models where you try to model how people transition from one state to another um, there. And, uh, and the way we use them is we, we, we basically, I can collect data on all of you and then create people on the computer. This is, I don't do this, by the way, American <laughs> engineer does this. So you will create people that look like you in terms of like a 10 variables, you know, uh, in terms of the, the, the mean and the standard deviation. And then, uh, and then he runs them through the model, and then he's going to tell me all this, you know, your avatars or your, the, the, uh, all these fake folks, you know, how many of them would develop certain health conditions. So I'll show you an example of this, I'm telling you in a second. Um, we, even, uh, we even play with uh, an interface. We're not designers, but basically here's an example where you would you would input some information, and uh, um, and then you would also. I'm hoping to use this for planning purposes. So you should you press a button, and you will be able to tell what happens to that given population if they if they implement a given public health program, and you get some predictions connected to it. So I'll show you an example on that in a second. <coughs> um, this is just data that shows you what happens to people over time in terms of rates uh, when you run these models. Um, we've, we've published this work, if you're interested, in uh, the, the most interesting article is this one that we wrote about how to use evidence-based decision-making in public health uh, using simulation models. We published it in the American Journal of Public Health uh, last year. And, uh, and the, the example that I'll show you, it's uh, this project that we have with San Antonio, funded by the Robert Johnson Foundation, where basically the city, the city has all these programs, and some of them are connected to diabetes, and they have uh, uh, collaboratives, where you know people from health systems to employers, they all get together and talk about how to improve or what kind of activities they're doing, and so on. So what we do is we, we provide technical advice to them on uh, what outcomes to track and, and things like that. So we had a call with them uh, two days ago on, on this work. Um, they, in San Antonio, they, they, had, they have also a diabetes registry uh, where they're collecting A1C data. And, and uh, so they have, the state gave them money to do this, like a line item, plus, plus then we took data from the behavioral risk factor surveillance system to look at the population of Bear County, San Antonio, and then make projections. So just to give you an example of how this would work is, so here's an example of data from that county. Got a little more data than that. So we take basic data, create people, and then we, we get results like this. So we get, um, here's an example of what would happen. So you take a cohort of people. You take everybody in San Antonio that is 20 to 79, and you say, let me see what happens to these folks over 20 years. So in a 20-year period, if you add it up, you're going to find that the <coughs> percentage of that cohort that has diabetes is going to be 38% over 20 years if you just add it up. And if you take the people that don't exercise you know, more than 150 minutes things per week uh, and uh, don't eat what is it, five or more portions per day, I think it is, or eat less than that. If you cut that by half, and this is just a made up number, but we, did, we, we call it improving lifestyle, you, you'll see that the model, for example, would predict how many people from that cohort, how many of them would do not develop diabetes. So some of the numbers may seem small, but when you multiply 2.5% by, by a population of 1.4 million, you know, the numbers can get can get pretty large. So, so for example, we presented some of these data. We did one with the A1C. So, uh, and we're talking to the epi epidemiology person at the, uh, the health department. 
and he looks at this, and this is part of the process, okay? This is the way that we set it up. He only focuses on end-stage renal disease because he knows how much that cost, uh, costs them, uh, so, or costs some of, the, some of the organizations they work with. So um, things like that, you know, you, only, you can only learn by just spending a lot of time talking to these folks that need this. And for example, one of the things they ask us to do next, <coughs> which we have to work on it next week, is basically, can you attach cost values to all of this? in a simple way that we can then go and say, you know, um, this is how much money we would save the system, you know, uh, or, you know, how much money we could potentially save. Um, so I'm going to skip this technology. At, uh, I'm, I'm hitting my time you know, Technology as a, a, um, adoption program. But um, we have another one on payment and delivery system redesign where um, we we were trying to increase the number of, of uh, moms that have a postpartum care visit, and those rates are low for, for some groups, uh, high risk groups. Uh, and uh, so we're working with, with the health plan, Mount Sinai, and it's funded by the Robert Johnson Foundation, uh, to, to implement a program to basically Next, working with a community health worker and, and, and social work at Sinai to connect women to, to res high risk women with resources and so on, work with the OBGYN at the, at the hospital and, and at the Sinai clinics and so on. And basically, the idea is that postpartum visits for commercial insurance are 80 to 90 percent. For health first patients, it's about 58 percent. So, health first is a Medicaid managed care plans, okay? And, and uh, what they're trying to do basically is increase the number of women that have that visit and the definition, I'll show you the definition, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's here. A member is considered compliant if she receives a postpartum care visit on or between 21 and 56 days after the delivery. So the idea is that, you know, how can you increase that rate? Uh, interestingly, when you get into project, projects like this, you think that, uh, what I told you about assumptions, you know, you think that a health plan is interested in this because it's, it could save money, right? It turns out that that's not what they're really interested in. They know that connecting women uh, at high risk here with the system is probably going to cost them money. But, but they also care about this insurance, health insurance plan ratings, you know, stars they call it and accreditation. So many times, you know, they understanding why people are doing things is it's it's <coughs> it's important because you may have not just one player but multiple players in a, in a project. I put a slide on that. Well I have here. Um, well you know I lost it. <laughs> um, but it's it's uh, oh here it is, I'm sorry, I I'm, I'm going too fast on this. But if you look at if you look at what people are looking for, you know a health system and a health plan are looking at utilization of, at, and costs. The funder funded us because the Robert Johnson Foundation funded us because we were reducing a disparity. These are mostly uh, Hispanic and African American women and, and also low income. So that disparity, they were very interested in that reduction in that gap. And then, uh, uh, and then what I told you about, you know, health, the health plan side of it, the the health insurance plan rating, which is. It goes beyond the cost. It's more, more about if we do this, you know, we, uh, you know, we provide better quality care, basically, and they're very focused on that. So I'm just going to say a few things here. You know, this is not easy work, right? Because you're always going to be just when you think you have it down, you know, you, it, it doesn't work like that. You have to keep working at it. So it's. Uh, involves doing this effectively involves science, art, and persuasion. Uh, you need to understand the, the, the goals of the program or whomever you're trying to convince. And then uh, even if you think you can, you can come up with a way that is going to work for every organization, it's going to vary a whole lot depending on the goals. The example of a, a MI with, and, 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 and great grandpa uh, is a good example of that. So you really don't know 
until you engage in conversations with the funder or whoever you're trying to pitch the idea of your program, you know, you won't know what is that you need to measure to, to make it work. But hopefully you have enough tools here to, to start thinking about like things you could do that go beyond just simply looking at looking at problems from, from just one angle on it. Okay? So so the key is that we'll never give up. So I'll end there. Uh, I'll end with this. That's a, that's a room where they bind books at the academy. That's next door to me. So I do all this research, and then next door to me, there's somebody playing with uh, George Washington's feet and, uh, <laughs> and binding books from the 1700s. Anyway, thanks. Going back to the earlier part of your talk where you're, you're talking about strategies for keeping people healthy outside the hospital, you focused on private companies. In a, in a city like this, there's a tremendous uh, diversity of, of uh, not-for-profit, community-based organizations. Historically, they tend to depend a lot on governments for their source of funding or for a big chunk of it, often federal money that might be coming to the health department and then do different categorical programs to them. But it, it, it seems like there's an opportunity then for, for hospitals to take advantage of those resources or those organizations with which the health department already has relationships. I'm, I'm curious if, there, if you see models of accountable care organizations where there's, a, there's good connections with, with, with hospitals, the not-for-profit and, and governmental sector, or or is it just the, the, the lens of the hospital people that they're more comfortable working with uh, businesses? I mean, what I've seen is that many things in life have to do with leadership, right? So if you happen to be a, a uh, non-profit organization or community-based organization that is lucky enough to have people on your board that that have a certain vision or connections and so on, then you tend to do, tend to do better at making those those connections. Because it is very hard for, I mean, it happens with us at the academy. You know, we're a nonprofit, and, and it's hard to get people to open doors for the programs we have. We have several programs that we, we do research, but we also do outreach. And, and, uh, and what I've seen is that because many of these systems are so close, then having having the right right mix of leadership it's it's important. I'm thinking one example that I'm thinking now. Uh, I'm talking to you. I'm thinking about a very concrete example. Uh, the the for example the federal qualified health center, community health center in Fort Worth, Texas, where I live, where the uh, the university was involved in getting it started. The uh, the CEO is actually a faculty member at the School of Public Health, and she went from being a faculty member in health management and policy to be to the CEO. But then on the board, they also have a, 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 a faculty member who's an assistant professor in health management and policy. So, and those are just the folks I know. I've known other folks on their board, but, but having people like that, that they're also connected with the healthcare delivery side, it's important. So, as, as I mean, my best piece of advice will be for organizations like that that have interesting programs is to to make sure that they the leadership structure, the board, for example, they get people that can provide advice where these things are going. So if people from business, but very diverse. You need a very diverse team to, to make to be able to take advantage of opportunities like this. Um, and. Uh, Many, many of them tend to be stacked with people connected to whomever the, the president is, right? Or friends of them. They don't, they don't go beyond that, they get into trouble. Yeah. Uh, just to follow up on yeah. Tim's question, um, yeah. given that New York has some of the <coughs> largest public hospitals in the country, I'm just curious. Is the management of those hospitals nimble enough to implement some of these strategies, or um, does the impetus come from downtown? Um, I haven't tried there, so I don't know <laughs> the answer to that. Um, having said that, um, 
I know that the academy, for example, is because we do work to inform policy at the city level, and to the, we work with the health department and so on. And I guess you could go all the way to the to the deputy mayor for the deputy mayor for health in New York. They just appointed was the vice president of the Robert Johnson Foundation. So, so many of these folks, I think, are very sympathetic to 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 new approaches on how, for example, the hospital system. There is called what health and hospitals corporation. How how they work. I don't know how likely it is. Even if you tell them, you know, you got to change the way you think. For an organization like that, how likely it is that they will change? I can tell you that in smaller places that I've worked, it's a lot easier. Of course, you know, like a place like Fort Worth, in a in a in a matter of in a few months, you get to know everyone. You know, even though it's a, it's still not a small city. Uh, so, um, I guess the answer is I don't know. General, no, I mean, I think it's it just, I think it's related to what you talked about. And there's been a big movement in, in recent, you know, recently just for medicine to think more broadly about the social determinants of health. Yeah. Healthcare, to think about how that's affecting their own outcomes and what, what healthcare, you know, providers should be doing. And it's been very interesting to me to see that because, you know, when I started my career, I started out as a physician. And the reason why I got into public health is because I felt there were all these things that the healthcare system couldn't address. And I, you had to address them in other ways. And now we're making these things sort of responsibility of the healthcare system again by, by saying, oh, hospitals have to take responsibility for the broader social determinants and, and asking them to do things which they don't know how to do. And in fact, maybe they should stick to what they know how to do. <laughs> Uh, and so this is a bit of a dilemma So that I, I have. First, I'm interested in your thought or in other people's reactions to it. And we see this you know, in, in incentives that are placed for hospitals to do things that will reduce their call out, it's cost driven. Um, and uh, it also, this issue also comes up in payment. I mean, I happen to be on a committee now, I am committee, that is tasked with figuring out how, to, how social factors should be included in Medicare value based payment. You know, should you adjust payment based on the population that they're seeing? And is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Because you're sort of legitimizing the fact that some population. So I don't know if you have any reflections. This is an issue that I think is, is very tricky in it's, terms of thinking about the direction in which it could go. And it's certainly at the core of you know, how the healthcare system interacts with public health more broadly. So if I have a flow of money coming my way and I, I run a hospital or I run some business, then and I know where things are going, then I'm gonna morph, if I control that, I'm gonna morph into whatever you want me to us to keep that flow coming. Right. In a way, that's what's going on. Yeah. So it's, it, it, gets, it gets into like, it can get really deep into like, do you believe that the way to, to change things is to do it proportionally, which is what you're seeing? So at first it may be like, you ask hospitals to do things they don't know what to do, hoping that they learn something from it? Or do you just you just go and destroy the whole system and start all over again? Um, and it's hard because it's if, if funding is going to certain organizations, you know they, they have vested interest to make it to let go easily from those funds. I, I what I've been seeing is that those changes are happening, but they of course don't happen as fast as we would like them to, to see them change. So we end up with organizations doing things that are good, but they may not be the right person to do it. I, I, I think the question you're raising creates a yeah. huge opportunity yeah. for public health to figure yeah. out how to pitch itself to the hospital yeah. community. And one small point of entree is the, the uh, ACA mandate that not-for-profit hospitals have to do a community health needs assessment and then use that to uh, inform their community benefit programs. And in Philadelphia, there's a collaboration that's been launched by the State Hospital Association and eight of the large hospital systems to try to figure out, okay, after we've all done our needs assessments, how could we be more strategic this time around in aligning our community uh, benefit investments? And uh, the health department, both for Philadelphia County and Montgomery County, which is next door, are a part of that conversation and been very welcomed into that. And I think that's, that's an example of a one way for public health to get a foot in the door uh, into this new opportunity. So in New York, for example, the Academy helped with the prevention agenda for the state. It basically says these are some targets 20 years out or I don't know, five, five years out, 
where the state should be with a list of programs they could implement all connected to public health. Then they asked hospitals that to, and, and, and local health departments, they did in steps. First, it's like, you know, you have to include something about the prevention agenda in your plan, in your community needs assessment, and what you tell the IRS you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, then this year they're asking them, now you gotta work together to make it happen. And I'm working on a project in South Texas where the medical school, the new medical school, where they're training medical school students to actually basically adopt a poor neighborhood in South Texas, a colonial, they call colonies, over the four years of schooling. The medical school is also interested in the community needs assessment for the whole region. And they're very interested in social determinants of health. Uh, the challenge there is that it goes back to the question, you, the, the, the way you phrase it, which is that the way they think tends to be more, more healthcare. Uh, they, they think about social determinants, but, but at the end of the day, it's more like, how can I provide a team to provide care instead of thinking, you know, the problem may be more basic, like connected people to help when it comes to housing or employment, or, uh, you know, but teaching them about advocacy to get their, their, their roles paid, I don't know, things like that. And that, but I think that's gonna happen. I mean, it's just, I guess the question is how long that takes, right? But anyway, thank you so much. Okay, we have to end. Thank you very much. Thank you.